John chapter 1, our reading this morning is John 1. We're going to read uh, all the way from 1 to 18. This is the whole uh, prelude of the, of the Gospel of John, uh, the introduction. Um, we're not gonna, I'm not going to be preaching through the whole thing this sermon, but let's read 1 to 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and to his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God the only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. This is God's holy word. May he add his blessing to it. You, be se- you, can may- you may be seated. And let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we ask that you would open our ears, that you would open our hearts. Lord, we pray that you would help us to hear your word. You'd help us to love your word, that you would be glorified as we put into practice that which was before us here today. We pray, Lord, that these wonderful words of John that open the Gospel of John, we pray that they would sing in our hearts. Lord, help nothing to distract us. Help us to truly catch a vision of Christ, the beauty of our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, what is the most important thing that we could do in this whole world? What's the most pressing thing, the most important thing that we could do in this world? Is it humanitarian aid, feeding the hungry, housing the homeless, getting clean water to those who lack it? If you see an infomercial or a commercial, I mean, on TV for some of these things, that will come at you as this is the most pressing thing. How could you go on your day doing anything else when there are people dying out there? There are people suffering. And we think, okay, that's a very important thing to do, humanitarian aid. Or how about the fight for human rights? Speaking up for the poor and the oppressed in the world, those who are in labor camps, those who are in all sorts of dire trouble. Maybe, we, maybe it's pushing back against tyranny and the erosion of rights even in our own land. Maybe that's the most important thing to do. Or maybe it's warning the masses about the various dangers in the world. Right? There's all sorts of dangers. You eat the wrong foods, you take the wrong medicine, there's viruses, there's all these things. What is the most important and pressing subject matter that we could be talking about today and that I could be preaching on, that we should discuss. Surely, much of what I just mentioned, these are matters of life and death importance. Rising tyranny, poverty, hunger, thirst, death. They're all important and they should be addressed. But they're not of first importance. They are not. None of the things I just mentioned are of first importance. They're not the most important. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3, for I delivered to you as of first importance. Okay, so here we have the Bible telling us, you want to know what's first importance? Listen up. What I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That's the most important thing. 
The gospel of Jesus Christ is the most important because it doesn't just deal with our bodies and this life only, but it touches the soul and it affects us for all eternity. Uh, as John Piper is famous for saying, the Christian should care about all suffering, especially eternal suffering, especially eternal suffering. Verse 28 of uh, Matthew 10 Jesus says, and do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Do not fear them. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Is there anything more important than knowing the one whom we really should fear, who can destroy both soul and body in hell? Is there anything more important than what Paul said is first importance? I don't think so. And John didn't think so. The Apostle John didn't think so. Last week we looked at the purpose statement of John and he made his intent clear. He wrote this gospel so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That is why the gospel of John was written. And I'm after the same end in preaching, in this message even today, in every message. I want to preach this book, the Gospel of John, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. I'm after what John's after, which is good, because you'd like it if the point of the sermon is also the point of the text, right? That's usually a good deal. Um, And I'm not talking, though, just about wanting those who don't believe at all right now to believe for the first time. I'm not just talking about that. I want you who already believe, to believe in him even more, to know him even more. I want you who already know him to know him deeper. I want you who believe to keep believing. I want us to have life in his name. And those of you who have life in his name, I want you to have more of that life abundantly. That's the goal of preaching. It's to take you, as it would say, as C.S. Lewis would say in Narnia, further up and further in. And really, that's what we find in the Word of God and in the Gospel of John. It is further up and further in. Well, look at how John goes about his goal. He starts his book. We already know what his goal is. His goal is that you would believe, that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you'd have life in his name. So how does he go about it? Well, notice this. He doesn't appeal to your felt needs. He doesn't hit you straight in the feels, as the kids would say these days. I'm not sure if kids actually do say that, but he's not hitting you straight in the feels, okay? He's not, I just like saying that. He doesn't, always, he doesn't hit you in the practical either. He doesn't say, here's 10, st- 10 steps for you to become a Christian. Here's some easy spiritual laws. Let me make this as clear as day for you. He doesn't do that. What does John do? He blows your mind with the glory of who Christ is. He shows you a picture of Jesus that he's, he's, what's he getting at? He wants you to be amazed. He wants you to read this about the word who is Christ. He wants you to read that or to, or to hear that preached and for you to be amazed because you see Christ. You see the glory of Christ. He's putting your eyes on him. He's showing you just who this man is. This man that by the time of John's writing had already turned the world upside down through his church. The other gospel writers, they usually warm up to their subject, right? Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they kind of warm up to it. John, not so much. John just grabs us by our collars and our boots simultaneously and throws us in the deep end. Okay, have you, have you, have you seen this? You know, there's a good video out there of this, this man teaching a kid to swim. He grabs him by his collars, he grabs him by his boot, chucks him in the lake, says, go swim. And here we are hitting the water, going under, and we're saying, but I don't know how to swim yet. I don't know how to swim. This is how, John, this is how John treats us. He says, you need to learn to swim. I'm putting you in the deepest of deep ends uh, in, in, of, of theology. And this is my goal too. I'd, I'd like to throw you all into the deep end. I'd like to throw myself into the deep end. I don't have a list of 10 things for you to do today. I don't have five application points. I don't have a bunch of exhortations on how to best live the Christian life. I only have one thing for you to do. I have one goal. I want to help you by the power of the Spirit and through this word, I want to help you see more of Christ and to worship him. 
I want to help you to know Christ and to worship him more and more. So where do we begin? We begin with the beginning. In the beginning, we read, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. If you're taking notes, this is the first point. In the beginning, okay? Like I said, there's nothing to do. I'm not, I'm not telling you you need to do something about this other than see the glory of it and believe it. Mark begins his gospel with these similar words. He says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark begins at the beginning as well. And he goes on to tell the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. Right? He says, here's the beginning of the gospel, starting, you know, here we are, A.D. 0, right? Or 4 B.C., it depends on how you want to count it. Okay, but there we are, that's the beginning. Not for John. His beginning is not that beginning. He has a, a beginning beyond that beginning, further back, all the way to the absolute and ultimate beginning of all things. In the beginning this really calls forth an echo of Genesis 1.1. If anyone had read their Bibles before and had stumbled upon the first verse of the Bible, they would, have, they would have already heard this in John, what he's saying. They would have heard an echo of it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And here John is beginning. He says, in the beginning was the word. This is where John begins the story of Jesus. With the very beginning of all things, indeed, we begin before the beginning. For this word, uh, we read, he was in the beginning with God. He was in the beginning with God. He was, God. he was with God, he was God, and he was in the beginning with God. Well, not only, uh, not only is this, should this blow our minds with this Trinitarian relationship, which it should, um, that the word is both with God and is God, but it points us to the fact that this is a self-existent word. This is someone that has existed forever and everything depends on him. Let's talk a little bit now about the word. So in the beginning, now we're looking at the word. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Now, word is an interesting word, isn't it? Is anyone else, maybe as a kid, thrown off by the fact that we're talking about someone called the word? The word is the word. You know, there's many words that John could have used instead of word, but he could have said the light. He could have said the truth. He could have said the life. But he settles on the word. And he does so for very good reason. That's his primary name for Jesus. Okay, spoiler alert right off the bat. The word is Jesus. We're talking about Jesus when we hear about the word. Jesus is the word of God. In the Greek, it's the logos. He's the logos of God. Now, let me just give you a little bit of background on this word. Because when we hear it, we might just think letters, sounds coming out of your mouth. That's a word. And so in the beginning was letters or was sound. And that's not what we're getting at. It's way deeper than that. So for the, in the Greek thought, for example, we'll go to the Greek thought first. For the Stoics, which was a form of philosophy, the Logos was the principle by which everything exists. They, they would basically believe that there's this pure, intellectual, rational thought that's behind everything, and it's in the heavens, okay? This rational thing. And, th and then our rationality is dependent on this heavenly rationality, this Logos, there's a similar idea in Gnostic thinking as well, where there's this, this impersonal thought out there, this um, basically fabric of the universe, so to speak. In the thinking of Plato, that ancient Greek philosopher, there was an idea like this as well. Um, that's the whole idea of the realm of the forms. Um, in this thinking, there's this realm of the forms. So in the heavens, there's the, the perfect example of everything. Okay, there's perfect goodness, there's perfect beauty, there's the perfect man, there's the perfect, essentially the, the design and the form of everything is perfect in the heavens. And here we live down in the realm of the real and of the shadow lands where we just have echoes and shadows of what's really real. So that's the ideal world, the realm of the forms, and then we live in the real world. Do I still have you with me? 
We're mere copies of the ultimate in Platonic thought. So in Platonic thought, that ideal world, especially uh, Philo uh, says these things, more of a Neoplatonic guy, uh, they'd call it the logos of God. That realm is the logos of God. That's the word of God. Another way to think of it is that um, things exist perfectly in the mind of God, in the mind of God, out in the heavens, And we see echoes of this in the scriptures, by the way, even in Hebrews as we think of the perfect temple and then we think that the temple on earth was a copy that Moses was shown the temple in the heavens and then he built the copy. This is the kind of the idea. But what you should see here is that the word used is logos, just the word for word. This thought, this ideal, this rationality, this is where we get the word logic from, out of logos, right? Logos refers to this inner logic to reason itself to the whole realm of thought and truth the foundation of knowledge of understanding anything but logos also simply does mean word or message here's a word here's a message it's not as narrow as just that but it does mean that as well as you can see the word is a loaded word we have biblical background as well though And I would think that John is probably drawing more so on the Old Testament than on Greek thought, although I'm sure he has that in mind as well. We have the biblical background. Just consider, once again, Genesis chapter 1. How did God create the world? By his word. Did we ever miss that? It never, it doesn't say God, you know, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, so he got out his hammer and he got out his tools And he got out the lumber and he started fashioning things. Is that what we read in the Bible? No, how did God create the world? He spoke it into being with word. God created by word, by logos. He spoke it and it materialized. What wasn't was when he spoke. We read, and God said, and God said, and God said, In Psalm 33, verse 6, we read, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. You hear that? And the earth as well. Everything that God made was by the word of his mouth, by the breath of his mouth. Uh, D.A. Carson shows how word is used all throughout the Old Testament in three main ways, the word of God. It's used in creation. God creates by his word. It's used in revelation revealing something about God. Here comes the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord came to me. The word of the Lord. You hear that over and over again. So creation, revelation, and lastly, in salvation. In salvation, God sent out his word and healed them. Psalm 107, verse 20. So the word is seen as God's agency in all these things. How does God do things? Through his word, by his word. He creates by his word. He reveals by his word. He saves by sending forth his word. Now, if that's not enough, the word is also personified in Proverbs chapter 8 as the form of wisdom. This wisdom is said to have dwelt with God in the creation of all things. We read in Proverbs 8.30, wisdom is speaking here. Wisdom says, then I was beside him like a master workman. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the children of man. So is this wisdom creating things or is this the son of God creating things? The question's meaningless. The question's meaningless. Christ is the wisdom of God. Christ is the wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 1.30, Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. Jesus is the wisdom from God. He is the word from God. This word is all of these things that we're talking about. It takes up the Hebrew meanings from the Old Testament, but it doesn't it also fulfill the philosophy of the Greeks? The, Jesus, he's the eternal logos. He's the eternal son of God. He's the foundation of wisdom. He's the foundation of reason and perfection itself. Jesus is the divine logos. He's the message. He's the speech of God. He's the word from God to us. 
To make it simple, hopefully, the word, Jesus, he is what God wants to say. He's what God wants to say to us. Jesus is God's fullest and final message to the world. He's the revelation of God himself. So God doesn't want us just to know words on a page. He wasn't just speaking a message of intellectual proportions to us. His message is personal. His message is the revelation of himself. He's saying, I want you to know me. And I'm sending forth my word, my word. And my word is myself, according to John 1. So the good news of the gospel is not merely a message that you need to believe. It's a person. It's a person. The good news is not just the message about Jesus. It's Jesus. He's the word of God. He's the good news. And so John is in the business of sharing him. And this is where he begins. This is where he must focus. Now, is anyone saved without coming to see at least some of the glory of this person, of Christ? Is anyone saved without coming to see some of the glory of Christ? No, of course not. No one is saved apart from seeing the word of God, seeing Christ. Will the 80-year-old believer ever have seen enough of Christ? No. Thousands upon thousands of years will not be sufficient to know and love the word who is before all things and in whom all things hold together. Well, that's moving on from this old idea of the word. Let's talk about creation by the word, okay? The relationship of the word to creation. The word is not just with God in the beginning. He is the creator with God in the beginning. Verse 3. After verse 2, it says, he was in the beginning with God. Verse 3, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now, does that seem to you like a, a redundant statement? He made all things. And then John adds on to it. And without him was not anything made that was made. You know what he's saying there? He's saying, if it exists in the made category a created category, Jesus made it. The Son of God made it. Now this might not seem like a big deal to you because you're orthodox. You know, we just confessed the Nicene Creed this morning. We believe these things. But this is controversial. This, many men spilled ink over this and spilled blood over this. That the Son of God was eternal and uncreated and that he himself was the creator of everything that exists. John, he's writing, as we see this, about the word, that he, he's, he's setting us up for this. The word, he is the Genesis 1 creator of all things. In the beginning was the, world, the word. He's writing about a new beginning, a new creation here in this, in this text today, talking about Christ. And he's deliberately setting it up as this narrative. Words like life, light, and darkness, they also bring us to Genesis 1. And so there we see that not only is he the creator from back then, but he's coming. He's here to do a new creation now. The word was not just at, at the beginning of history, but he's at the root of the universe. Okay, Anything that exists comes from him. And he himself is uncreated. Leon Morris, a commentator, he comments that this phrase, it calls to mind, uh, the phrase I'm talking about is, in the beginning was the word, that this phrase calls to mind not a completed state, nor a coming into being, but a state of ultimate, eternal, and unchanging being. What did God reveal himself to Moses as at the burning bush? Moses says, tell me your name. I need to know your name. And what does God say? I am. I am. And what do we hear about the word here? In the beginning, the word was. He was. He's, he's the eternal, unchanging being. He is the fountain of all creation. As John would write later in Revelation, that he is the one who is, and who was, and who is to come. He is, was, and is to come. The word who created all things is uncreated. He exists in and, of its, in and of himself. 
At the Council of Nicaea, Arius was a false teacher, and he was arguing for this position, and many were following him, that Jesus was not, he was arguing for the opposite position, sorry, that Jesus the Son was not equal to God the Father. He would say, there was once when he was not. There was once, there was once a time when he was not. That's what he was saying. And we should say, wrong, wrong, Arius. And this is, we, we stand with Athanasius, who declared the opposite. There was never a time when he was not. Or to give it, you know, to say it here in the Greek, there was never a time where the logos was not upholding the cosmos. Everything, the cosmos, the universe. There was never a time when the Logos did not uphold the cosmos. He's always been. He is who he is. He is always, he's the great I am. And we'll see that time and time again in John. He's not going to let that point go. Jesus will later say, before Abraham was, I am a blasphemous statement if he was not the God of heaven. We read in Hebrews, the start of Hebrews, describing how God spoke to us by his son. He says, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. He is the creator and sustainer of absolutely everything. We studied Colossians as a church in our Bible studies, and we read these great verses in chapter one. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him, and, and don't be thrown off by firstborn there. It means he's the, the, he has the right to it. He's the heir of it all. It all belongs to him. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. If something is in the made category, he made it. He is accepted. John leaves us no room here. There's no room for a created Christ in the Gospel of John. The word made all things, and without him was not anything made that was made. That's our origin story. The word created you. You know, sometimes we correct our kids when, when you say things, we're praying, and, and they'll say Jesus instead of God. You know, you say... You're talking about maybe who, who created you, and they'll say, Jesus. And you'll say, well, yeah, God created you. There's no need to correct them. There's no need to correct them. Jesus is God. Jesus is God, and he is the creator. This is our origin story. So when Bobby asks, Mommy, where did I come from? This is where you need to begin, and maybe this is where you want to begin as well. At the beginning of all things is our personal triune God, the Word who was with God and was God. He's at the beginning. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are together one in creation. God the Father creates through the agency of his Son and with the Holy Spirit hovering over the face of the deep. Everything that exists was purposefully made by the sovereign, personal, triune God. Now what a contrast that story is with the story that our world's been enamored with for the last 150 years. That story, the Big Bang and macroevolution. The creation of all that exists through the explosion of nothingness from out of nowhere. Time and chance acting on matter. I was recently watching a, a documentary on volcanoes and even there, they couldn't leave it well alone. They had to bring this in. Now, for once, though, this is refreshing, actually, they had a hard time lecturing the viewer on climate change, human-caused climate change, due to the inconvenient truth that some of these volcanoes belch more pollution in one week than all of the U.S. automobiles do in one year. Okay, so sorry, Greta, facts are facts. But I, I digress. So because they had to leave climate change alone for one episode, they worked in that great atheistic origin story wherever they could. We were even treated to a great animation showing a volcano, a super volcano, exploding from somewhere, creating clouds that didn't exist before, that then created the oceans, and then supercharged life things that turned all the way up into man. 
And, and I laughed out loud. That's how, um, I guess what would be the word, that's how much un, uh, I've untrained myself from what I learned in public schools. It's funny to me now. You look at that, you think, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. And, and their story is, that's where you come from, Bobby. The super volcano blew up. It's utterly fantastic. And I mean that in two ways. It's, it is a cool story. It's kind of fun. It's like, oh, that's neat. But it's also a fantasy. It's a fantasy. R.C. Sproul was so good at this type of thing and critiquing it. I remember him critiquing um, on some of his lectures, The Big Bang. And he would refer to this great astrophysicist who would get on the radio and declare with a straight face, 15 billion years ago, the universe exploded into being. And R.C. would ask the astute question, what was it before it exploded into being? What was it? If it wasn't being, then what was it? It was non-being, which is like saying it's nothing. And I don't know much about nothing, but nothing doesn't explode. Okay, you, nothing doesn't just go boom, and everything's there. As the classic Latin phrase has it, I've been putting more, too much Latin in this today, ex nihilo nihil fit, which means out of nothing, nothing comes. Out of nothing, nothing comes. This should be obvious. It should be very obvious. And beyond that, all of the exquisite design of creation, from the quirky sea crab to the soaring albatross that doesn't touch land for sometimes years, all the way to the human eye, the human brain, the human soul, these things can't be honestly explained as random mutations. Time and chance acting on matter Sprinkling billions of years on a problem doesn't make it go away, right? And we know this. We are just too good at suppressing the truth. That's what we're good at. Romans 1, 18 to 22. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them. The whole world just saying, God exists, God created this, God created you, and yet we're pushing it, we're stuffing it down, we're suppressing that truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened, claiming to be wise, they became fools. They became fools. And this is our problem too. This is not just the problem of the atheist astrophysicist out there. This is at the root of all of our sin. Refusal to give thanks. Refusal to give thanks, bitterness, anger, lust, adultery, hatred, murder, theft, deceit, pride, envy. Think of it all. What's at the heart of it? A refusal to thank God. It's deliberate unbelief. It's saying, no, God. It's cutting God out of the picture. It's cutting God out of the picture. So we're, we're, we're all without excuse. Well, let's move on in, in our passage today now to salvation by the word. Okay, because we are without excuse, even though we're created by him. And this is getting at what John, why John's bringing up the word who was in the beginning. Why are we talking about the word? You know, the creation already happened. Like I hinted at before, John's bringing up a new creation. Jesus is coming for a new creation. We're all in need of a savior. And here's where, here's where there's good news. The reason John is focusing on the word is not actually to talk about creation. He's about to announce to us that this word who was in the beginning has come, has come to us. Later on, he says, this light would shine in the darkness and not be overcome, verse five. Verse nine, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. And ultimately, verse 14, and the word became flesh. 
and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Just think again of that title, the Word. The gospel is not merely a revelation of truth. It is the accomplishment of salvation. Like it says in Psalm 107, God sends forth his word and heals them. The sophisticated and the Gnostic among us would like to think of salvation in psychological or philosophical or even emotional terms. And we'd want to keep it all in our heads and maybe tucked neatly into our hearts. But John blows all of this out of, out of the water because this is the word who became flesh and dwelt among us who lived in Jerusalem, who lived in Galilee, who, lived every, who went, went about all these places. This is the word who is also the Lamb of God, who will be sacrificed to take away the sins of the world. As John begins his epistle, 1 John, he says this, that which was from the beginning. Notice that he does the same thing in the same style. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Do you hear how tactile that is? How many times can you reiterate the fact that I saw him? We're not just talking about Greek philosophy. Oh, the divine logos and it came down and if you accept it into your heart from a distance, you'll be saved in some spiritual way that makes no difference. No, John's saying, I met the man. I met God in the flesh. I saw him die. I saw him taken to a tomb. I saw the empty tomb. I saw his hands with the, with the scars. I saw him laughing and smiling. I saw him eat fish on the beach. I watched him ascend into heaven. I watched God do that. The God-man, Jesus Christ, do that. You see, there's no entertaining just the truth claims of Christianity. Either you're covered by the blood of this man who is God, or you're not. Either you believe in the man who is God, or you do not. John will not give you a third way. He leaned on this man's side while sharing a meal, and he saw this man shining in brilliant light. He's, he was close, and he also worshipped him. And he says, you need to see this man. Now, how do we bring such glorious, these glorious truths of this text, how do we, how do we bring this to a close today? Well, we need to realize that no one's going to do this text justice. I don't even know, I don't think anyone knows where to start with such glorious truths. Um, so we should, we're all going to fail. We're going to fail at understanding it fully. We're going to fail at articulating it well. But perhaps we should end with what I believe was the intent of John which is just for you to see more of Christ, for you to really to pile on the images, to heap up the phrases of glorious truth until they bury us with glory. Maybe then our slow hearts will be quickened. Maybe then what is hard will finally be broken and made soft. We've seen today already that the word was in the beginning with God and that he was God. And what a glorious mystery that is. It paints a picture of our Savior dwelling in perfect joy with the Father for all eternity. Jesus would later say in John 17, 5, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So the picture of, of God is a picture of triune love and triune life. You know, God, God was never lonely don't entertain the thought that God created us ragtag bunch of people and creatures because he was bored or lonely. God didn't do that for that. God was perfectly content in and of himself for all eternity for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit exist in this perfect relationship of harmony and of love and of joy. It was out of God's joy that he created everything. It was out of his desire to reveal himself to more, to resound to his glory. That is why he created us. That's why he created us. And Jesus came to save us from our sins. And he did all this, once again, for the glory of God and to bring us into that glory. See, this is what we were made for. We were made for his glory. We often think, 
that God, we, you know, this is where we get it so wrong. We want God to give us a happy, healthy life and just to make everything perfect for us. But God's more interested in bringing us into the depths of his glory and showing us what we truly need and taking our small gaze off of ourselves and onto what can only truly satisfy, which is himself. You see, this whole passage from, from verse 1 all the way to 18, it's talking about the revelation of God himself. When we read about the word, and we'll read more later uh, in following weeks about how he became flesh, how he reveals God to us, we're really talking about God showing us God. God giving us God. The greatest gift of the gospel is God himself. Hebrews 1, 1 to 3 says this, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. God didn't send us just a book. He sent us his son. And based on what we've read here, this is, we shouldn't construe this as God sending someone else to do his work for him. God didn't send a lesser angel or some creature to do his work. No, God sent himself to save us. God sent himself to save us. That's the profundity of these words. God sent God. As the prologue will end in verse 18, we read, No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. God has come to make God known. Our Savior is our God. Our God has come for us. Come to him and be saved all the ends of the earth. That's what John's saying. He's saying the core, the center of the good news is this person, the word, the logos. He made you and he came to save you. Trust in him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your son, who is the word. Lord, show us more of his glory. Show us more of your glory. Lord, may we be caught up into depths and heights that we could never have imagined. We just pray that you would lift our gaze from small things and help us to behold great things. Lord, our desires are too, too small. Give us more of yourself. Give us what we don't even know that we need. Have mercy on us. In Jesus' name, amen.